Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to Chapter 16, Part 1. We're going to cover some definitions. We're going to talk about tactile receptors. And then we'll also talk about taste and smell. We will follow up Part 2 and Part 3. Part 2 will be the eye, and Part 3 will be all about hearing and equilibrium. Sensory receptors are going to provide us information, not only external, but internal. There's always going to be a stimulus, and there's always going to be a receptor. If we remember way back in Chapter 1, we said stimulus, receptor, uh, control center, and then effector. And it depends on the receptor type, and we'll talk about those in just a second. But I want you to realize that some of these senses, like vision or hearing, are going to be really complicated. We're going to, you know, basically with the eye, we're taking light, energy, and we're turning it into an action potential. And that action potential is going from the retina to the brain. And then we have to perceive what it is that we just saw. So we're going to talk about some complex uh, special senses as we move through this PowerPoint. When it comes to skin, you can see here we have certain areas of the body that have really small receptive fields and some that have very large. So if you were to prick your finger, you know exactly which finger and where on your finger once that sensory message makes it to the brain. In let's say on the back here or on the shoulder, there's a really large receptive field. You know something is wrong, but it's in this much larger area. You cannot pinpoint exactly where that stimulus is localized. The term sensation is when we're consciously aware of a stimulus. Think about the fact that there's tons of sensory signals that are going to the brain stem that we're not consciously aware of. We don't know what our blood pressure is right this moment, right? The things that we're usually consciously aware of, those are the signals that reach the cerebral cortex. And it's only a fraction of the stimulus that we take in every day. So remember this kind of labeled line. We talked about the homunculus and we said there are specific areas or receptive fields in the cerebral cortex and they're mapped to different areas of the body. We should note that there's some receptor variation. So receptor adaptation can happen if you have decreased sensitivity to a continuous stimulus. So there are some receptors on certain organs and certain cells that show limited adaptation. So head position, inner ear, all pain receptors. Phasic receptors adapt rapidly. So think about pressure receptors, um, also smell, right? Olfactory is a real phasic. You smell something and then almost as soon as you perceive that you smelled it, the smell goes away. Classification of receptors come in two types. We have general sense receptors and special sense receptors. Think of general sense as simple structures, maybe touch like tactile receptors of the skin. Special senses, we have five that we're going to look at. We have smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. You can further categorize the receptors by the type of stimulus. So we can see there's exteroceptors, so that's external environment, intero, internal environment, and then the proprioceptors or proprioceptors. Remember, these were detecting body and limb movements, and all of that information was being sent to the cerebellum so it could coordinate with the cerebrum about movement. Further categorizing receptors based on stimulus. So not only is it external or internal, but what type of stimulus is going to cause the receptor to react. So a chemoreceptor detects chemicals, thermoreceptor, temperature differences, photoreceptors, light intensity, color, movement, mechanoreceptors, um, any sort of distortion. I think of it mostly as stretch, but it's also pressure, vibration, touch. And then this is the only one that probably the name doesn't make a lot of sense, but nociceptor is a pain receptor. So using some of the terminology that we just reviewed, let's talk about referred pain. So first we said you could have general or special senses. 
well, we're looking at skin here, or we're looking at organs, so we're going to say this is general sense, right? Special sense is eye, ear, etc. Then we said you could have internal receptors, or you could have external receptors. And then we said you can have different types of receptors, specifically nociceptors for pain. Remember, you could also have thermoreceptors, um, mechanoreceptors, right? So the list goes on and on. So for referred pain, this is a nociceptor. And what happens with referred pain is your brain cannot tell whether it's coming in externally or internally. So I'm sure you've heard people having a heart attack, their left side and arm hurts, they have pain. So it's actually the heart, it's actually an internal visceral sensory message that's going in through the spinal nerve and up to the brain, but they're, remember they travel together. So here, let's say this is a somatic sensory, a skin sensory message. And that travels on the same spinal nerve up to the brain. So your brain is having a hard time uh, differentiating between an internal and an external pain. So that's where we get this term referred pain. You can look through this image. There are certain areas that are going to um, hurt even externally, even though it's an internal organ that's actually sending the pain signal. Before we move on to special senses, I should mention tactile receptors or touch receptors. There are two different kinds. There are unencapsulated and then there's encapsulated. So I want you to see that these are free nerve endings and this is the receptive end of the neuron. This is the dendrite. Remember, you're going to have some sort of stimulus that triggers the neuron at the receptive end, the dendrite, and this is going to generate an action potential and then send a message to the brain. So these unencapsulated or free nerve endings do not have connective tissue wrapped around them. I think of these as being able to be a little bit more sensitive. Encapsulated touch or tactile receptors have connective tissue wrapped around them. And it kind of makes these, I think of them as either on or off. So we either have pressure or no pressure there's not really kind of a need to gauge how much. We finally get to move on to special senses and the first one is gonna be smell or olfaction. We can see here that the olfactory nerves are gonna extend through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and they're gonna be found in the superior portion of the nasal cavity. Basically, you're gonna have a chemical enter the nasal cavity and then if we enlarge here you'll see that there's mucus layer so the odor molecules are going to be suspended in this mucus layer and eventually bind to the olfactory receptor cell and what's interesting is there are olfactory hairs so there's tiny little hairs sticking off of these nerves this is the first time we've seen hairs on a neuron right so the odor molecule is going to bind to the hairs. That's going to generate an action potential in the olfactory receptor cell. And you can see as it travels through the cribriform plate that it's going to synapse here in the olfactory bulb. This is kind of just the written words of what happens to detect a smell. You're going to sniff or breathe in deeply. You're going to have some chemical odorant bind proteins in the mucus, and that's going to stimulate the olfactory receptor cell. You're generating an action potential that we saw is going to synapse in that olfactory bulb, and eventually that information is going to be received by the cerebral cortex, and that allows you to perceive and identify the smell. We move on to the second special sense, and that's gustation, and that's the sense of taste. So gustatory cells are chemoreceptors, kind of like we talked about smell. These are chemicals that we're tasting. There are different types of papillae on the tongue, papillae bumps. So we have the filiform papillae. There's no taste bud action here. You're usually just manipulating food or it can tell you whether something is smooth or creamy. The fungiform, because they look like mushrooms, 
The fungiform papillae have a few taste buds and they're located on the tip and the sides of the tongue. There are some foliate papillae, but the, the major papillae are these valate or circumvallate papillae. These are the largest, the most numerous. They're the ones that contain the majority of the taste buds. There are five basic taste sensations and they're spread all over the tongue. We have sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, which is meaty. To talk about the pathway of taste, we have to start with the taste bud. So here is a taste pore. So you're going to eat something or drink something. That chemical is going to enter the taste pore and it's going to bind to the gustatory cell. These also have microvilli. They have little finger-like projections. That chemical is going to trigger an action potential in the gustatory cell, and that's going to synapse with a sensory neuron, and then that information is going to be sent to the brain. So if we want to follow this gustatory pathway, we're going to start first with the chemicals, right? This person is drinking coffee. Those chemicals have to make it to the taste pore. And then once the chemicals are in the taste pore, then they come in contact with the gustatory cells of the tongue. They're going to generate an action potential in the gustatory cells. So we have an action potential generated here, and then that information is going to synapse with these two cranial nerves, glossopharyngeal and facial nerve. Those are then going to synapse in the brain stem, specifically at the medulla oblongata, then eventually the thalamus, another synaptic event, and then we finally get to the gustatory cortex that's in the insular lobe that we talked about earlier. And that's how you perceive what it is that you're tasting.